this is the first beginning of beginning of this uh, vasa. Starting off with this community uh, meditation for one week. <coughs> And then you are here to awaken, to become appreciative, be uh, rec recognize the natural state of awakenedness rather than trying to get anything or become anything. So the emphasis is on an attitude using these words and the form, the monastic conventions, the retreat, and the uh, situation you're in to be the, the knower, the witness. So this uh, emphasis on Bhutto, on the one who knows or the knowing in the present of the way it is. So this is this is called what I call reflection, witnessing, observing, knowing. Knowing it in terms of Dhamma rather than knowing about it in terms of uh, qualities, uh, whether it's pleasant, good or bad. This kind of knowing is not a critical function of mind. It's not making judgments, value judgments about anything, but observing all conditions are impermanent. The base Sankara and Icha. So, being a knower of impermanence rather than somebody that knows all about something or doesn't know anything. Now is awareness, mindfulness is a sense of listening, of opening, receiving, allowing whatever you're feeling, whatever you're thinking or whatever is happening to be the way it is. It's not a controlling kind of practice. We're not trying to, to control the mind, but to liberate it from the uh, habitual tendencies to control it. So reflecting on the way it is, this is the here and now, we're sitting, the posture is sitting, the, the body's breathing, observing the way it is, uh, you know, so the, the most obvious conditions that one is experiencing, and observing the mood, the state of mind you're in, the emotional state, physical, posture, breathing. Here and now, in the present moment. Now ref reflect on the here and now, this is all there is in terms of experience. We, we think of the future, remember the past, but it's always here and now. And it's important to, to reflect upon and recognize that there's only the present moment because we can live our lives planning for the future. The future has, you know, is where the success and 
enlightenment and all the good things hopefully will happen or maybe everything will fall apart, doom, destruction, death, decay. The past is what you remember in the present. So, so by reflecting this way, you, you begin to uh, accept this, rest in the present, acknowledge that this is all there ever is, the present. In terms of experience, reality is now. It's not practicing meditation to get enlightened in the future. So this is, many of us, this is how we're, our minds are. In fact, all of us are conditioned to regard time as our reality. So when we practice meditation or do whatever we call meditation, it's always with this attitude of doing something now to get a result in the future. That's a delusion emphasize that is a delusion. If you start with a delusion and never see through it, if you just operate with the, this basic delusion, you know, no matter how many hours, years you practice meditation, you end up with delusion. So what I try to emphasize is, is paying attention to the delusion the basic delusion. So you get to know it, you know the, what it is, rather than just go along with it and uh, operate with all best intentions, all sincere, uh, industrious, hard-working determinations to conquer the defilements and all the rest. If the basic delusion is never seen through, never recognized, then you will be disappointed after years of dedicated hard work, meditation retreats, monasticism, and all the rest. But right now, if you that attitude to this retreat practicing in order to get some desired result or maybe you've, you've been meditating for a long time and you have memories of great periods of bliss and tranquility or something that you'd like to have again. So you're, you're practicing now in order to hopefully have another a wonderful meditation experience that you remember from the past. Or maybe you've never had any kind of pleasant result from your meditation, <laughs> and you're just sitting here dreading, the, dreading the, a week of group practice. Some, some monks can't stand it. They don't even come. <laughs> <laughs> But the awareness, awareness of, of, of this, that's what I'm pointing to. I'm not trying to tell you anything, but remind you. So in the sense of I'm somebody that has to do something, you know, I, I'm what I, how I've come to terms with this problem is actually intentionally thinking it and listening. I used to sit and think, uh, I am an unenlightened person who needs to practice hard in order to attain enlightenment, hopefully, before I die. Something like this. Just put it as this. I am this person that needs to really do something in order to become 
what I, what I think is enlightenment. And so that's in the future, enlightenment is in the future, and I'm this, this person with uh, flaws, faults, weaknesses, emotional problems, etc. <coughs> now by listening to it, you know, you, you begin to separate, you know, that, that which listens to this, the knowing of this, the listener, is not a person, not somebody with defilement. That you create that. That's that's thinking. You you're creating yourself. You're you're identifying yourself as a person that is there's something wrong with you the way you are now and you need to do something to become something better in the future. Now that's th the thinking process. That's, the, that's what we create into consciousness in the present moment. So by objectifying it, by listening to yourself thinking, deliberate, intentional thinking, then you reflect that which is aware of the thinking is not thinking, is it? It's not a thought. It's not a person. It's not, you can't say it. The person is something you create, your identity with your body, with your memories. But if you, do, if you stop thinking, if you are the knowing rather than the thoughts, then you begin to uh, discern the difference between pure awareness and consciousness that you, that, uh, where you create yourself as a personality, as somebody in the present. Now a personality, we have, we have a past and a future. We think of ourselves as somebody born so many years ago, an identity with a country, with a place, with family, social position, being male or female, being white or black or Asian or European or whatever. These are, these are words that we've created, human beings have created, and we attach to these concepts as personal identities. So the way to, to begin to discern the difference between pure awareness and the ego or the sense of a person, a separate personality, is not through trying to get rid of your personality or try to convince yourself that you don't have one, but observe it, observe the, the personality, what you think you are, what you believe you are, uh, what you feel, your feelings, your emotional, powerful emotional feelings, or maybe uh, emotions like despair or boredom, doubt, confusion. So this is when we talk about reflecting on the way it is, its ability to observe the feeling of despair or doubt or anger or greed or sense of ourself. The, the observer, the witness, and this is, is in its context of Bhutto, the Buddha, knowing the Dhamma. So when we, during this retreat, it's an attitude of refuge, taking refuge in the puto, in this knowing. And then discerning, this, uh, this knowing is non-personal. I don't create it. It's not a, something of 
uh, you know, that is a cultural condition or a personal ability. When I create myself as a person, then I'm, I'm emphasizing, you know, my thoughts, my memories, the illusions I have about myself as a separate entity, as a personality. So in, uh, in this practice, it's, it's a discerning, learning to discern. And the difference between discerning and discriminating, say with the thinking process, uh, this is a, the thinking process is a discriminatory process. It's, it's, it's always saying this is bigger, that's smaller, better, worse what should be, what shouldn't be, right and wrong. This takes the thought process, doesn't it? You have to think and, and then uh, form opinions, judgments, value judgments. They have value that something is better than something else. That's a, uh, putting a value on it, isn't it? Or this is how it, you know, something life should be a certain way. It should be fair and just and monasteries and individuals and monks and nuns, they should be compassionate and kind and unselfish. And these are, this is the thinking process of, of uh, that we have of how we create these, what is the best, what is the worst, what should, what shouldn't be right and wrong. The discerning ability is what we call wisdom or panya, which is discerning. It's like this. The personality, I can say, when I reflect on I'm somebody who is here to practice in order to become, I'm discerning it. I'm not judging it. I'm not saying... You know, not uh, so I form uh, a value judgment about my personality, but it is the way it is. You know, this sense of self that arises with thinking, I am. I'm discern observing it. It is a Nietzsche, isn't it? it? You can't sustain it. It has no sustainability. You have to keep propping it up with obsessive thoughts and beliefs and grasping. So you're discerning the thinking process is like this. You're aware of the of the of the posture, the body. The body is here and now. It's sitting, so sitting posture, sitting Four postures we use, for sitting, standing, walking, lying down. The breathing, inhalation, exhalation. All this is happening simultaneously on the condition level, in the sitting and breathing. The mood, the kind of emotional state. You can observe what kind of mood you're feeling, what... What is uh, what is it like at this moment? The kind of internal ambience like this. But it's not a matter of saying it's good or bad or even right or wrong or anything like that. But just observing it's the way it is. So they say the goal of the holy life is for liberation from delusion. That's what say monastic uh, monasticism is for. Uh, and when uh, but 
Venerable Vinita and Damiko took the Upasampada and said this for the liberation from attachment, from delusion. This is the purpose, this is the point of the holy life. So then they, then, then we think that, and we reflect using the teachings of the Lord Buddha, not to grasping ideas about Buddhism, but through applying that to the here and now, to, to the reality, to the way it is, that each one of us individual entities is experiencing at this very moment. And that's why uh, in this retreat, emphasizing the being aware of the thinking process rather than becoming the thinker, be the, the knower of the thinking. Uh, the thinking process is an acquired function. You're not born with the thinking. You know, so it's, uh, it's acquired and then it's uh, not, it's not a natural condition. It's an artifice that we create human beings create out of ignorance. Now it's not anything, not criticizing thinking because it's valuable, it has a, you know, it's a, it's a gift that we have, but it is very limited. Thinking is, is very, very limited. And so when we bind ourselves to thinking, then we, we are bound into what is called a duality because thinking is, is a dualistic function. It's not a transcendent, it's a, you can't transcend, you can't be liberated through thinking. Well, thinking, no matter how sublime your thoughts might be, still bind you to the limitation of the conditions to birth and death. So it's, it's not a matter of thinking yourself to enlightenment, but be, we, can, we use thought concepts. We have the teachings for noble truths, uh, uh, suttas and so forth. These are words, conventions. But these words then, they're not for grasping, but we're learning how to use thought for reminding, for recognizing, for realizing, rather than for identifying. So when you, you know, the th when you think of yourself, you, know, you, you have certain self-images about your self-worth, whether you're a good person, bad person, intelligent or stupid, attractive, unattractive, right or wrong. So this is discrimination, isn't it? This, we compare ourselves with others. Some, some people are better than others and some are worse and some we approve of, some we don't approve of certain conditions, certain thoughts, emotions that we have, we, we like and others we don't like at all, don't want. So this is, this is the discrimination of thought and judgment, the critical mind. And this is all about the conditioned realm. Because in, on the conditioned level, there is a preference as obviously some things are bigger, than other things, and there's male and female, and there's there's uh, certain things are right and wrong on the condition level, and that condition world that we create, we create that world, we believe in it, we commit ourselves to it, and the condition world is its very nature is dukkha, 
and suffering, first noble truth. So when we bind ourselves to the conditions, our own thoughts, memories, identities, opinions and views, then we're, we're in this realm of samsara, so it's a realm of suffering. Even at its very best, and even the conditioned realm at its very best, there's still something unsatisfying about it, incomplete, dangerous even. Anything that we attach to can be snatched away from us at any moment. Death is looming in the future. Loss and separation from what we depend on and love and hold to. There's always danger. There's always the evil forces, the dark specters, the shadowy world, evil lurking in the back. <laughs> And that's the way the conditioned realm is. It isn't all just beauty and happiness. Is it? Even though we'd like that, that's what we'd like. That's what we want. So then the liberation from this illusion is not by, uh, you know, forming any more, any views about it, but recognizing it for what it is. It is what it is. You know, co all conditions are impermanent. And so this, uh, this ability, this discerning ability of panya, developing the wisdom, is the whole point of the Buddhist teaching. Encouraging us to u develop, cultivate wisdom, discerning, rather than just trying to refine the conditioned world. Trying to, you know, control the conditioned world so that the dark forces, we can keep them out. We build a fortress around ourselves and, and prevent the enemy from entering. Well, that's what the world is involved in now, isn't it? It's uh, the United States is very busy trying to fight off the axis of evil, the terrorists. Now we don't have even a a clear enemy, like in the old days, we had the Soviet Union. We knew who, who our enemy was. Now, there could be terrorists in this temple right now. We get paranoid enough, you see them, you know, behind the post. <laughs> <laughs> behind the bushes out there. I mean, paranoia taken to extreme, you know, is m total madness. But, uh, you know, it is madness even in, 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 in the way that everybody accepts it. Because there is danger on that level of conditioned phenomena, isn't it? It's dangerous. And that's the way it is. The conditioned realm arises, ceases. You have, you know, how can you make it otherwise? You would like it to just to rise and be beautiful forever, but that's not the way it is. The conditioned realm is is uh, is like this. It begins and ends, and this is discerning the way it is. It's not saying that there's anything wrong with it or it should be otherwise, but it's like this. So it's we're not criticizing the conditioned world, but recognizing it realizing it is like this. And that which is aware, the awareness itself is not conditioned. So that's why uh, awareness is the gate to the amata dhamma, or the gate, amaravati, the deathless realm. So this, this gate means that here and now we have this opportunity to enter this gate, and that's what awareness is. 
mindfulness. Because a mindfulness is not conditioned, it's not something you create. The more you try to be mindful, the further away you are from it. You know, you, I'm somebody that's not mindful and I've got to really practice mindfulness. Is another proliferation of thought, isn't it? I'm, I'm, an, I'm not very mindful. So during this retreat, I'm going to really be mindful, practice mindfulness make myself into somebody really mindful is a proliferation on the thinking level again. So when you operate from I'm going to really practice mindfulness and you're not discerning what you're doing, you're, you're creating yourself again as somebody that's got to do something. Now when you, as soon as you're aware of that, that's, aw that's awareness, that's mindfulness. You suddenly realize good intentions. It's good intentions, isn't it? Practicing mindfulness, good thing to do, recommended. But the awareness of that, I'm not very mindful and I'm going to practice hard in order to become mindful, is a mental thinking, proliferating habit. So, learning to, to discern, uh, be this knowing rather than this person. Uh, it's like getting to pure subjectivity, be the knowing rather than the person that's trying to become the knowing. And this is, this is a very important to, to, to re it's a real, it's reality. Because this is really the truth. We're not the per the person the personality is so dependent and changeable, so ephemeral when you really observe it. So be the observer rather than this flighty personality. Personalities are you know, they go up and down, you're happy when everything's going well, and you get depressed when everything falls apart. And it's so dependent. Personal happiness is so dependent on conditions, isn't it? You have to, you know, there's always this fear of even, well, I'm happy now, everything's going my way, but who knows what's going to happen in the future. But awareness, then, is non-personal. It's not, you don't create it, you recognize it. It's like this. And so when, I, when I'm doing this, I'm recognizing. Uh, there's attention. I'm paying attention. I'm listening the sense of open receptivity. I'm not trying to uh, create an object to pay attention to, but uh, just this sense of relaxed attentiveness in the present. So rather than becoming, you know, trying to become, make your mind into a nice, tranquil uh, experience, this mindfulness is, is not becoming anything, but letting go. Attentiveness, awakeness. It's, you don't create it. You can't make yourself that way. You just let go of things, relax, open, receive. So uh, I encourage you to reflect on this, the, the pure subject, the knowing, the bhuto, and the object, which is the personality. Don't be afraid to have opinions and views and prejudices and biases and 
so forth, but listen to them, not in terms of to criticize anything, you know, any uh, the quality of them, but to recognize they are what they are. So I am somebody that needs to practice I'm an unenlightened person that needs to practice in order to become enlightened. Listen. I used to uh, deliberately think then, listen. Because that's how it seemed on a personal level. I became a monk and that because I felt I was a, uh, you know, a kind of total burnt out wreck of a person. Unhappy fed up with life and I wanted to live in a way that I could respect and, and, and become, maybe, maybe I could become enlightened if I worked hard, practiced hard. And so th this is, you know, this is what brought me into the monastic life. But then the, in the monastic life, you still, if you still don't challenge that assumption, then, you know, no matter how, you know, dedicated you are as a monk and pure in the discipline and so forth, you still have this, this oh, you know, I've, I've done all the things, but I'm not getting the reward I expected. Oftentimes we expect to be rewarded for being moral and keeping rules and being good. Don't we? Uh, that's the way the conditioned world, you're rewarded for obeying the rules, not breaking the law, being a good boy, being a good girl, obeying mummy. <laughs> doing what the teacher says, being a good sport and all the rest, you should be rewarded for that. So this is, but this is still the, the self, isn't it? Wanting a result in the future, expecting something, some kind of result called enlightenment, thinking that by sitting for hours, practicing hard, you're going to be rewarded for that. Hard work pays off, don't be lazy. So these are, you know, this is, these are, this is a cultural conditioning. This is, gives us a sense of self-worth and, and how we, we are conditioned, we're programmed by the society we come from their values and their views, prejudices. So now we're, <coughs> we're taking refuge in the, in the Bhutto, in the Buddha, so knowing of this, the discerning, recognizing all conditions are impermanent because this sense of I am somebody that needs to do something in order to become I, I have to think that I'm thinking that intentionally and listening to it. That which is aware of the thinking is not a thought, is it? That is, it's awareness. This is awareness. When it, whatever you're feeling, whatever emotion you're experiencing, you know, you're happy, sad, greedy, angry, frightened, despairing, doubting, confused, or whatever, the awareness of it. You know, you say, if you're feeling confused, don't you feel, what should I do? How should I practice? I don't know what my life is for. How should I, what should I do in the future? You're aware, there's awareness of this is what we might call confusion. Doubt, confusion is like this. So we're, uh, we're not trying to, to, uh, to get out of these states, but recognize them. The emotional 
condition that you're experiencing right now, the awareness of it pointing to emphasizing the awareness, be the awareness, not the condition. So you're discerning the difference, you're learning to to really recognize Buddha, this is another word again, but it's not to go around thinking that that you're you're you know the Buddha, but be that, be this knowing, be this aware awakened conscious reality. Where the condition phenomena appear arises and ceases. We're not trying to control the condition phenomena anymore or uh, but recognize it. So it's the knowing. Because condition phenomena is Dhamma. The way it is, conditions arise and cease. So there's, there's not a judgment against it. It's discerning the difference between the, the unconditioned is like this, is awareness, the deathless. And the condition, you can't be aware of being aware. You can only recognize awareness is this. And then with that, we, we, it's real. It's 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 not a it's not a dependent state uh, that uh, you have to control. It's just unrecognized. We don't we don't recognize it in our cultural programming. So recognizing. Realizing, this is the th oh, the third noble truth, and then knowing that whatever your thinking, mood, feeling, memory, sense of self arises and ceases, it is like this. So during this retreat, uh, the schedule was, is, uh, I encourage the, uh, to conformity to the schedule just as a practice, because we, just as a supportive uh, group endeavor, so that it, and, uh, and observe, you don't have to like this or agree with it, but even if you don't like it, you can observe, <laughs> not like it, uh, things like this, so that, that this, uh, you know, you can, I can practice much better, you know, I can't practice in a group or things like this, some kind of people have very strong views about what they need and what they have to have, supportive to the where they're at. This is all the self again, isn't it? It's all about me, I need this, and I can't do it that way. Now, if you're listening to that, that sense of me and uh, my practice and so forth, this, I'm not saying you shouldn't think like that, but observe, it is thinking, it is a, an attachment, it is sakya ditti. So it, it is the way it is. And then, uh, you know, this kind of what we call surrender to the form, which is a pretty hackneyed phrase, and I find it quite, you know, I've heard it so much I find it irritating when I even think it and say it. But it means, what it means really is, um, you know, this is the form we're using for this week, and it's this way, you know, it is, it is what it is. And then maybe you'll say, well, they didn't consult me about this retreat. It's just those tyrannical senior summoners that just impose this 
And that's another ego again, you see. So even if we're being the tyrannical, being a, me being tyrannical to you is not an obstruction to enlightenment, unless you want to make it one. So then, uh, and that's the, your creation. So this is where we're not, you know, we're not helpless cre victims of fate, but we might seem on a personal level. But we're quite able, you know, once we recognize, realize the, the, uh, this awareness, the liberation, it's then we can deal with, we can, we can, we can respond to situations, to conventional, to the conventions that we're, we're experiencing in the present. So this is, since this isn't a tyranny, then it's not, you know, nobody's going to spank you if you don't cooperate, but encouraging. <laughs> uh, because uh, I find personally a, a group practice is a, has a kind of, it's we supporting each other in, a, in this endeavor. It can be quite, you know, doing it for for the community, not just for my, my practice, just the way I want to practice, but for the welfare of this monastic community also is sharing the blessings of this practice.